The challenge is you got to know what your mission is, what your vision is, and get clear on it. Not just do it because you think it's exciting or cool, but do it because you have a bigger reason behind it. I said, I'm going to try this for one year. I'm going to do it for a year. I'm going to do it once a week for a year. And I'm going to see how it feels. And I'm not going to try to make any money. I just want to add value and help people. Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, he's determined to be a world champion Pokemon trading card game player, Pat Flynn. Lewis House and his show, The School of Greatness, has reached hundreds of millions of people. In fact, it does so every single year. And the last time Lewis was on the show was in episode, I think, 56, which was nearly 500 episodes ago. That was maybe seven or eight years ago. It's been pretty incredible to watch his journey and his growth. Back then, he was into LinkedIn and helping people master webinars. And now he's interviewing people like Kevin Hart. And he had once interviewed Kobe Bryant. And we actually hear an amazing story about how he booked that interview and the all, all the amazing things about Kobe, rest in peace, um, that came in and around that time for Lewis. And we also get some insight in this episode today about the journey of podcasting, what it takes to step into this world and what it might be like to include video along with the podcast as well. Um, also finding peace within yourself and to have the confidence to move forward into your full self and your full authenticity. All that and more in today's episode. This is session 541 of the Smart Passive Income Podcast. My name is Pat Flynn here to help you make more money, save more time and help more people too. I hope you enjoy this interview with myself and Lewis House from the School of Greatness. Lewis, welcome, uh, welcome back to the Smart Passive Income Podcast. It's it's been a minute, my man. It's been too long. It's good to see you, brother. Way too long. I think the first time you were on the show, if you might remember, you were talking about LinkedIn, and that was like your jam. Yeah, really. Was that like eight years ago or something? Or? <laughs> it, it was, and you told a beautiful story about how getting injured actually helped you. And I'm not going to get into that story. Everybody can go back and listen to that and do a little time travel. But uh, things are going awesome. For you now, and I wanted to bring you on to talk about this journey that the podcast has taken and where it's gone. So it's been fun, man. How have you been, man? Like things are things are going good. T tell us how good. I'm very grateful. One of the one of the reasons I'm grateful is because I feel peace in my heart, and I feel for for many years of my life, I was trying to figure out how to uh, create peace as opposed to just being peace. Mm. And I know it's probably a little bit off topic, but I think is you know. No matter what we're creating, whether we're launching a podcast or a Pokemon channel or a business or a physical product or whatever it might be, or we're seeking something, I think it's, for me, it's been important to continue to heal uh, whatever's gone on in my life so that I can be peace while I create and create from a place of acceptance of self-love and peace. And for me, that has allowed me to personally create with a lot more energy, clarity, focus, mm. excitement, uh, less stress and anxiety and more joy. And so I think that's, uh, for me, the foundation of where I've been over the last you know year creating that journey for myself. What, is, what does peace mean to you? Being able to sleep at night within moments. Uh, it means when, when things do go unaccording to plan, not being triggered in reaction mode and stress and anxious and frustration and angry mode, but more, okay, that's unfortunate. And, and allowing myself to feel something for a moment, but really just going back into what's most important, which is mm -hmm. my peace, which is a place of, I may not like something. I may not like what someone did to me or said to me or how something was broken down in, in my life. I, I may not agree with it, but allowing it to take my peace and have power over my, my peace just means that my attention is going into the problem as opposed to into a solution or into what I'm grateful for in those moments. So for me, it's been a, I used to hold on to things a lot more, you know, especially mm -hmm. in my 20s and early 30s. And now it's, you know, something happened a few days ago uh, with a team member of mine that, that we had to let go. They did something illegal. Let's just say that. And mm -hmm. it was kind of, it was kind of shocking. And I was like, wow, this is like just common sense. But at the end of it, I was like, okay, I can sit here and be frustrated and upset and message this person, my anger, and I can't believe this. Or I can say, all right, let's just do our due diligence and um, and move on and get back to my vision, my purpose, which is being of service to people, which is creating from a place of helpfulness, of solutions for individuals, 
I think that's something you do extremely well, which is your whole journey has been teaching people, hey, I don't have this, the answer. Let me go figure out how to make a dollar. Let me figure out how to make $10, $100. Here's how, it's, how, how we did it this month. And mm. I messed up here, here, and here, but I'm going to go try something new this month. And here's what I learned. And so I think that's, that's kind of what I've been trying to do as well. That's great. And, you know, it often takes time for us to get to that point where we can have that clarity. We can have that sort of mental stability to make those decisions, because like you said, things are going to happen that are out of our control. I mean, you got kids, so you know this way more than me. (laughs) You know, it's probably things out of your control every day that you're like, what am I, what are these kids doing? They don't listen to me. They're this or that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's easy to go, oh, are we (laughs) failing right now? Or are we bad parents or anything like that? And, you know, every situation is different, but we also have to remember all the things that we are doing well and the things that we are grateful for. That is just going to be a journey that everybody's going to continue to be on. And, you know, as you know, as you've grown like new levels, new devils, right? Yeah. Like what are the big devils that are sort of haunting you now as a result of like your huge success and your reach and, the network that you've built, it's its amazing, but I'm sure it comes with some. Yeah, I think the, I don't know if it's a devil, it's an opportunity for growth, which is I never thought of myself as leading a team. Like I was the receiver in sports. I was like the the game time play. I made the plays, but I wasn't like the the orchestrator of the team. I wasn't the rah-rah guy. I wasn't, the, you know, directing people on the team. I was like, I don't want that. I just want you to throw me the ball or, or give me the ball to make the shot. And, yeah. you know, I'll just be happy with that. I never wanted to be like, okay, here's what we're doing. Here's the vision. Here's the, and here's what you need to do better in coaching people. That was never my intention. And it's kind of something I rejected in sports because I was afraid to take on that role. Hmm. But when, when taking on a business and building a team, it's, it's not really an option. Sure. I've hired someone, uh, that that works with my team and manages the team a lot so I can be in creation mode more. But I've still got to make tough decisions and lead people and become a, and develop myself as a better leader. And I think that is an opportunity. We doubled our size of our team this year. So bringing on more people, I've never had this many people on my team. So it's just, how do I navigate that? How do you manage more? How do you give time to people and onboard people and train and develop mm-hmm. leadership skills and others? And just, make tough choices. So for me, I never wanted that, you know, 10, 15 years ago. And I think I'm embracing it more because I understand that's what's going to support me in accomplishing our mission, which is serving 100 million lives weekly to help them improve the quality of their life through media and content, what we're doing. And I can't do that on my own. I can't do that by myself. I can't do everything on my own. I'm not that good enough to do it all on my own. And it's going to take a team of people to support that mission. Was there ever a sense of pride that came along with your work such that it was hard to let go of it and give it to others? Or was it really easy for you to hand those things off? I would love to hand things off in a second if I knew someone could do it, you know, at, mm-hmm. at, a, at a level that I was excited about. And it would make me, I would let it go so quick. So it's learning how to find the right people who already have that skill or having the patience to onboard and train someone to get to a certain level where I feel comfortable. And I think that's just the challenge because. You know, someone like me and you, we learned so many things in the last 10 years really on our own. We we tested so many things from course creation to building the websites to writing content to creating videos to editing it to launching a webinar to creating a slide deck to going to events to learning public speaking to learning how to sell to affiliate marketing to all these different things. Like we just learned on the go. Yeah. And most people learn one of those things, you know, at, at, a, at a job or something. They learn, they take on one skill and then they don't go beyond it. You and I have developed I don't know, hundreds of micro skills that all combined create what we have and what we've built. And I think that's really hard to expect someone to come in and be like, okay, so you should just know how to set up and run a webinar when most of the world has never done one and never done one at the level we've done them. So how could they really do that? Or we just expect you to create this course or develop this worksheets or something that might seem so simple to us isn't intuitive to someone else. Um, So really having the patience to teach and train over and over as opposed to expect someone to understand and get it right away has something that I've had to learn to do. Yeah, I mean, we experienced that back in the day when we hired VAs from overseas, for example. It's like, hey, go do this and, you know, 
they try, but you got to teach them, you got to train them. So give yourself a little grace if you're hiring people or if you're trying to find some help, you need to know yeah. that you have to invest some time up front to also exactly. help them help you essentially. And the challenging thing is you may, you may bring someone on, you may think they're great, and then you spend three months trying to train and onboard, and they're not the right fit. And then you feel like, oh, I should just go back and just do this myself because it took so much time and it didn't work out. And I think you've got to be willing to, this one makes someone more scalable in their mm -hmm. ability to be patient and hire the right people and realize they may leave in three to six months or may not work out. And that's just part sure. of the business cost. How do you, as you are hiring your team, consider culture within your business? Um, you don't just hire for the task, right? You hire for culture and being a part of the team. Yeah. How, do you, how do you get to know somebody in that short period of time? I just did an interview yesterday because we're, we're constantly interviewing people and recruiting and, and looking to hire. And I interviewed someone yesterday after they went through a few rounds with my team already. And I said, listen, this whole conversation is to scare you to, to not be the right fit because it's part enrollment, but it's part, are you ready for the task of what's going to happen? And let me paint the picture of what we expect and what our standard is for our team. And they read in our, in our job description, they read the, the core values of, of the company in our job description. So we put that there and said, this is our values. This is our mission. Do not apply if you're not aligned to these values and this mission. So we try to really get people not to apply and just unqualify them early on. Then they come through the, we get tons of applications and our team is sifting through and really only picks like, okay, who are the three of these 300 we think are the best candidates? Then let's put them through an interview process. And it's all about values and vision because I've realized, I think I heard Elon Musk say this in a video. <clears throat> he was like, so many times I've made the mistake of hiring based on talent. But what I should be hiring more on is values and kindness. And he's like, I've hired so many extremely talented people who are not nice people. And it hurt me and it hurt the culture and the, you know, and it hurt the process. And I think finding people that have, I always say this, it's about the attitude, energy, and the effort. You know, we can, we can train you more on the skills. What we're doing is not rocket science. We don't have to be like these brilliant architects like you were. <clears throat> it's, it's not rocket science. It's not, you know, mathematics with architecture and design. It's not this complicated thing. It's, stuff that we can teach and train people on, but mm -hmm. the attitude, the energy, and the effort is the most important quality for me and alignment towards our values and our mission. If you're not excited about what we're up to with our values and our vision, then don't be here. You can go somewhere else. You can go work wherever, Facebook, Google, TikTok, or start your own thing or, and, and take on the weight of being a business owner if that's what you want to do or be a consultant, whatever. Yeah. Um, but if, if you're looking to build something to change lives and you want to see people grow and improve in their life, then that's what we're about. But attitude, energy, and effort is what I preach constantly because too many times on the sports arena, I witnessed incredibly talented athletes who were way better than me. I mean, so gifted, freaks of nature, uh, physically, right? Athletically, coordination, everything. And when their attitude or their energy or their effort was down or low, it took everyone else down. And it hurt the team. And a lot of those people got, you know, removed, put on the bench, and then removed from the team eventually if they didn't change their attitude, their energy, or their effort. So we're here to make an impact. And you can't do that when there's a few people that are taking down the rest of the team. Yeah, you remind me of that moment in time when Allen Iverson was complaining about practice, right? I'm talking about practice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, you know, you got to show up. Even if you are the star player, you still have to be a part of the team and, and show up and lead by example. And you've been doing a great job of that, especially in the podcasting space. I've seen your growth. I've been watching you from the sidelines. You've developed as a interviewer. You've developed as um, just a skilled entertainer and, 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 and somebody who I could feel really, truly cares about the people who are watching and listening on the other end. When you started your podcast, what were some of the huge struggles and challenges that you had? We have a lot of people who are interested in starting a podcast today. I mean, today is now easier than ever mm -hmm. to do so, but it's up here that matters. Yeah, I mean, it's easier than ever to create and launch. When we were doing it, I mean, you were one of the first two people I talked to when I was looking to launch my podcast, you and Derek Halpern, mm -hmm. because Derek had a show, I think it was called Social Triggers back then, 
Yeah. And this was 2012. You started your podcast in 2011 or 2012? Uh, 2010, actually. 2010, yeah. So you were OG before me. Um, <laughs> you, were, you were like second wave, you know, if Joe Rogan was, I don't know when he was, 2007, eight or nine or something. And then the kind of the weird, quirky tech uh, podcast that, you know, had their own little small raving fans. And yep. that was it, I guess, maybe some NPR, NPR show or something. Mm. And then you were kind of like second wave. And then I'd be like wave 2.2 or something. I don't know, two, two and a half, uh, in 20, January, 2013, I'm coming up on nine years now in January. And I remember calling you and Derek and being like, I remember specifically what you said. I was like, do you think this thing has any legs, this podcasting thing? And do you think it's going to go anywhere? And like, do you enjoy it? And you told me it's one of the most fun things you do. I remember you saying this. You said it was one of the most fun things you do. And you also said something around the lines of, I don't know if this was exactly how you said it, but you said something around, you know, the quality of listener, like the quality of person who consumes it is such a high quality relationship. Like the mm -hmm. relationship I have with those people and it's a much more qualified lead for things I'm promoting. People sign up from there. And I was just thinking to myself, okay, like maybe there's something I can do this. And I had been just interviewing people for my own sake, just to, to learn from people for, for years, but I wasn't recording them. And I really started thinking like, maybe there's a way I can get this out and help more people. Cause I wish they could hear these conversations, you know, stuff like me and you would have at like 2 a.m. at like Vegas blog world or something, you know, it's yeah, like, yeah. I wish, I wish people could hear <laughs> what I'm learning from Pat Flynn over here because it's incredible conversation, which we're having. So the challenge people are going to face today is obviously, I don't know how many podcasts are there now over a couple million, I think. Yeah. A couple million. Yeah. And I think, um, the challenge is you got to know what your mission is, what your vision is, and get clear on it. Don't uh, not just do it because you think it's exciting or cool, but do it because you have a bigger reason behind it. And I remember saying to myself after I talked to you and Derek, I said I'm going to try this for one year. I'm going to do it for a year. I'm going to do it once a week for a year, and I'm going to see how it feels. And I'm not going to try to make any money. I just want to add value and help people. And that was my intention. It was not like, I, no one saw this podcasting thing being like a big business. It was just more of like, people didn't even know how to download a podcast back in, when you were doing it. You had to teach yeah. people and educate them. Okay, <laughs> so you go on your phone and then there's this like purple little thing and you have to like click it and, and then you have to type in uh, Smart Passive Income and then you have to go there and you have to click subscribe. Yeah, I think back then it was on the iTunes app. It wasn't even its it own podcast iTunes. app. Yeah, it wasn't even an app on the, on the phone or whatever. So it was so much harder to get people to listen. It was challenging, man. So I think the challenge people are going to have is getting clear on their intention and knowing that this is a long, long game. Unless you're the, the one person listening who's got 5 million followers, 10 million followers, that might be able to transfer 5% of your audience over if you're lucky. If you push as hard as you can and get five, maybe 10% of people over after a few months, mm -hmm. but that's, that's a stretch. You know, that's, a, that's hopeful, wishful thinking and people will check something out once, but if it's a bad product, they're not going to come back. It's going to be so hard to get them to come back and listen or watch again. So you've got to make sure that you got to be in this for the right reasons and you got to be in it with a, a long-term vision in mind, not a short-term vision of how do I make money quickly, mm. rather how do I serve one person? And that's what I, that's literally what I thought. Like if one person listens to this and it helps them, then I'm cool with that. And I remember thinking I'm creating this for me 10 years ago. I wish I had this to listen to because it's what I need to learn. Mm. And um, I, I just think that the mindset's got to be, I'm coming into this with a long run. You know, I've done, I don't know how many videos I've done. I think I've done over a thousand videos on YouTube now, I think. I don't know. I have to go double check, but I think it's maybe like 800 or a thousand videos. And I feel like it's just now starting to take off. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like wow. it still hasn't taken off. I feel like we're about to hit 2 million YouTube subscribers, you know, a half a billion downloads on audio and video combined for a long form listen or long form view. We've got, you know, billions of short form views and, you know, one to two minute listens or, or video views here and there, mm -hmm. but I don't count that towards downloads. Um, really, it's like a, our watch time on YouTube is 
24 minutes, 24 and a half minutes, which is every time someone clicks, they they watch for 24 minutes. And our YouTube rep says that's our YouTube rep says that's unheard of. Like they don't see that on their YouTube stats internally. We also have much longer videos, you know, hour, hour and a half to our videos. So it's, uh, we can keep people longer than a, a 30 to 60 minute video that someone might has or a 10 minute video. But so we really count like, okay, are they listening for over 20 minutes? Because that's a deeper listener or viewer. And I just think you gotta, you gotta be willing to, to mess up and, and be consistent with your mistakes in terms of like, I'm going to keep showing up and making it better. Even if I mess up so many people you've seen, Pat, I'm, I'm assuming start it and they stop within six months because it just gets hard. And they're like, I'm not making any money. It's hard to book guests if I'm doing an interview show or it's hard to like constantly come up with ideas for content if I'm doing solos mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, I'm only getting 50 views or 50 downloads. Why am I doing this? So you got to have a deeper service based mission in mind, in my opinion. Otherwise, you're just going to be unmotivated and thinking, I'm not getting results after a year, two years that I want. Well, let me go try something else. And so this is, you know, Pat and I have been doing this for Pat's over 11 years. I've been doing this almost nine years. And I feel like in the last two years, it started to see like growth. Yeah, that's insane. I mean, it just shows you how long the game has to be sometimes. I mean, we Long, look yeah. at other creators here on YouTube or or on podcasting who, you know, I remember interviewing MKBHD here on the podcast and he said that his first 100 videos were for his first 100 subscribers, right? And now he's at Crazy. like 15 million and Mr. Beast, same thing, his first several hundred videos were just Minecraft videos that really yeah. didn't do anything as he was finding his voice and look at him now, he's got viral <laughs> videos and he's breaking the internet and, and stuff. I don't know. Like squid games and everything, yeah. Dude, it's so crazy. Before we get into what the podcast looks like now and some of your strategies that are working today, I, I do want to ask you back to when you first started, how did you know that when you took this gamble on starting a podcast that, yeah, this is the thing, like I'm going to go in and I'm going to commit to this for a long term now. What was that moment or was there a moment? I didn't know when I first launched it. I just knew it was something I was really excited about and I knew mm-hmm. that it was it played into my skill sets because I was already curious about people. I was curious about learning and I love to sit down and interview people. So I was like, maybe this could be a platform I could use. I think when I did like my, I remember launching a, a course uh, called School of Greatness Academy and getting a bunch of people signed up through it. And I used the podcast to promote it mm-hmm. and getting so many people signed up and the engagement. I remember thinking about you because I was like, wow, these people are fully engaged and committed. And it's because they've been listening to me for the, for a couple of years and improving so much. And so now we do like a six month kind of boot camp personal growth, you know, accountability program for them. And those are still some of the most like passionate, you know, community members that we have that get incredible results. And I remember thinking, oh, there's something here with this community. You know, Mm -hmm. it started with one episode and one listen, and now it's grown to this. And then maybe like doing my first live event and seeing the people in person now, then I was like, oh, these people are passionate and excited about what they're learning and improving. And so that was another level. Then writing a New York Times bestselling book based on the podcast, I was like, okay, this is like mainstream now. And now Mm -hmm. getting like mainstream press and being on Ellen and Today Show and Good Morning America and all that stuff. I was like, oh, like this is a real thing. You know, it's not just you and me like thinking, hey, let's do a podcast in our basement and, you know, maybe a few people listen. It's like, oh, this is reaching mainstream audiences right like your media company now exactly and i and it's funny because three years ago i was doing a strategy session with a friend of mine uh rory vaden who's a brilliant strategist and 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 business mind um and i go to him for a lot of strategy now and three years ago i I was just like huh i feel like i need to come come visit you, Roy, in Nashville. And I was like, I don't know why, but I feel like you just have such an analytical strategy mind that I feel like you can see things differently. I'd love to come and just see like the direction of my future. Kind of give me feedback on my brand. I'll tell you my vision, what I'm up to, and just kind of give me some feedback on what you think I'm doing well and what you think I can improve. And after this two-day session with him, he goes, I wasn't going all in on the podcast. I was doing the podcast to promote my courses, my mastermind, my books, my events. It was a tool to like promote my stuff, but I wasn't making money from the podcast really three years ago. I was making some off advertising, 
but we weren't like taking it seriously. It was like some ads would come in. I'd say like, maybe yes, but I wasn't like focused on it. And here's the scary thing. I wasn't monetizing YouTube. I'll get back to that in a second. So three years ago, I do a session with him. And at the end, he goes, okay, something for me is very clear. And I may be, you know, ignorant here, but the main thing that you have that you do the best at, that is the easiest for you to do, that impacts the most people is the podcast. And yet you're not really monetizing the podcast and you haven't gone all in on it. You do it on the side to promote your other stuff. Mm -hmm. And he goes, why not just go all in and building a media company and being media? Don't be a mastermind, you know, based on revenue. So we analyzed all the revenue streams and based on revenue, our company was a mastermind and courses company because those were the two highest revenue streams. So he's like, yes, you have media, but based on revenue, your company is a mastermind and course company. And what I want you to do is start moving that over. And maybe that doesn't happen year one, but it starts swinging the pendulum to where your media will start becoming number one. And these other products and services and coaching and events will be two, three, four, five, seven, whatever. And I was like, man, I don't know. I just don't see it. You know, I didn't see it clearly. And he's like, in order for that to happen, you're going to have to give more time and attention towards the podcast, the show, which Mm -hmm. is the main thing. You're just not making it the main thing yet. You're going to need to go all in on it. And at the time I had been recording, I remember thinking seven years ago, I was like, I feel like video is going to be a thing in the future. Let me hire a videographer. Let me hire an editor. And we'll just start filming all these interviews and doing them in person. Because at the time, everyone was doing like the Skype, you know, Ecamm call recorder. This is pre-Zoom. It was like you just recorded on Skype and you did audio only. You didn't really record the video then. It was just like audio and you just post the audio. So it must have been seven years ago where I was like, I just feel like I need to record these. I think it was kind of the time like Gary V was starting to do the daily. The daily V. He like D-Rock came on board. Maybe he came yeah. on board like the year before and they were like just doing more video content. And I was like, I just feel like I need to film these. But I wasn't making any money from filming. So I was investing in a team to record for five years. And I didn't make a single dollar off of video. Wow. But I was posting them on YouTube, the, the interviews twice a week. I had nothing optimized. I wasn't optimizing thumbnails or titles. It was just kind of, they didn't even really look that good thumbnails. It was kind of like, just throw something up with an image. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until the uh, beginning of last year that I looked at, I said, you know what, let's just turn on YouTube ads for some videos and see how it does. Like, I have no idea if it's going to make me a few thousand dollars or, or what. And I turned it on the first month and I think it made like $25,000. I remember thinking, well, it's, it's not nothing. It's, it was like, oh, that's something. It can pay for like a few people on the team. It wasn't close to what our you know, main revenue streams were, but I was like, something. And then I actually mm-hmm. was like, huh, I wonder what like all the views I've had on YouTube. And I went back to see all the views. And then I calculated based on the CPM of that month. And I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, this is a million dollars that I would have made. Had I just pushed one button to turn on ads. Jeez. But, I, but I remember five years prior when I started filming and posting on YouTube, it was very kind of sleazy ads in, in people's videos, right? And I was yeah. like, eh, I don't know if I want a Ferrari in front of all like my videos about like, you know, growth right. and mindset. Here in my and garage, all. right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I was just kind of like, eh, I don't want to put, I don't want other people to leverage my brand to sell their stuff. So mm. I just want, and I just want to give for free. I was just like, you know, I'm just going to give for free because we weren't really monetizing the show. We weren't yeah. thinking of that as the main revenue. We were thinking, let's just help people. And then if they want more, we can sell them our programs and services and our coaching. So we said, okay, we're going to go all in on this media thing. And it's going to take some time to start transferring and making money and, and building that revenue stream. So that was three years ago. And now the show is the number one revenue stream in terms of media, you know, just media in general from audio. And then last year, the beginning of the year, we turned on the, the, the ads and now YouTube's a multi seven figure revenue stream yearly from Jeez. just ads, just AdSense, which is kind of nuts. If I think about it, it makes me want to throw up in my mouth because I realize I'm not <laughs> that, that good of a business person from not seeing this sooner. But I think sometimes we, you know, we need, we just need to learn at our own pace. But I was like, you know what, the thing that I'm 
collab that I did and I saw the long-term vision was hiring someone five, seven years ago to start filming. And now all these old videos, because YouTube is evergreen, whereas mm -hmm. audio is more linear and it's much harder to get people to go find and discover your back catalog. People do, but it's a lot harder, you know? Yeah, and there's no algorithms helping you either. With YouTube, I have videos from three, four, five years ago that are that will pop and be our number one videos of the month that can make five, seven, ten grand in one month that I shot five years ago. And I'm like, that excites me because now we've got a, a thousand videos or something like that. And we can keep optimizing through TubeBuddy or whatever other software people want to use to optimize thumbnails where we can pretty much see that we can get the growth really quickly once we optimize thumbnails and, and titles. Mm -hmm. So for me, that excites me about what's possible for the future with video. And that's exciting to me, Lewis, because as I told you before we hit record and as people who are listening to this might not know, this is actually our first time putting the cameras on while doing an inter interview here on the Smart Passive Income podcast. And this is up on YouTube now, or eventually it will be. And so I would love to ask you uh, for all of us and selfishly as well, what are some tips you have for that? Because as somebody who's been doing audio for so long, I've just been, you know, I remember recording like a, like a test of this. And I remember I was kind of like, like this, like leaning yeah. over and it wasn't camera friendly, but it yeah, was yeah. like, you know, I'm in my zone with my mic and now I have to sure. be present on camera too. That's a lot. Dude, like, it's a lot of energy, man. <laughs> right? Like what are, what are some tips? I mean, imagine being across from, you know, I film on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, and I usually do two interviews a day for Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday on my film days. And now we're doing two hour interviews and it's, I'm sitting across from someone in person, staring into their soul, right, right. being attentive and present. You know, at the end of that, it's, it's a lot of energy for four hours a day of on screen interview time. Plus preparing plus connecting with guests before and after and you know everything it's, it's a lot of energy but i got i think you got to figure out what your zone of genius is and for me i'm comfortable in that space it's something i like doing it's something that's you know works for my type of personality i mean there's so many things that we could talk about but i, I think it starts with the basics and this is going to sound boring and really not sexy and not advanced but i mean the thumbnails and titles are like everything just like the cover of a mm -hmm. book if people don't have a great cover of the book they're not going to buy it it's not going to spread so thumbnails and titles obsessing about them like obsessing and split testing them over and over again we use a thing called tubebuddy which is i think 50 bucks a month or 100 bucks a month and it's a software that allows you to split test your thumbnails and i'm telling you we went from a million and a half views a month pretty much consistently for a year and a half, two years. And it was kind of like slow incremental. So maybe it was like 750,000 range views a month four years ago to like a million a month for a year and then a million and a quarter for another year and then a million and a half until last year in, I guess, January, February, March range, we started split testing. We started doing a bunch of split tests from previous videos. So videos that are already out for years or months, we would start split testing the thumbnails and the titles. We went from an average of, you know, a million and a half views a month. After we were split testing for six months, we started to see growth right away the next month a little bit and a little bit every month. But then after about six months of split testing, I don't know, 500 videos, it went from a million and a half to like six million views and then six million views to seven million and then seven to eight and a half. And then it hovered Jeez. there for a few months and it stayed. And then I think maybe it went down to like six and a half again, and then it went back to 10 million. And it's kind of been around the nine to 11 million view range this year. So without split testing and having better thumbnails and titles, we'd maybe be at, I don't know, 3 million views a month. So I can tell you to like be entertaining or have great questions or come up with great content, but the content is irrelevant if people don't click on it. Yep. Yes, you need the content to be great and all these other strategies to make people stay after 60 seconds and the end screens and yada yada. But I'm telling you, it's a thumbnail game. It's a title game. Then you've got to deliver on a great product. You've got to make sure your, your stuff is good and engaging and have the right edits and all that different stuff. But 
we have, you know, we don't have fancy graphics on our videos. You know, it's a sit down interview. Mm -hmm. It's a conversation with three cameras and we edit the camera when someone's speaking and it zooms in or it zooms out or it goes to me or it goes to the guest. It's not like this animated, blah, 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 like crazy, like in your face, you've got to be a high energy. No, it's actually kind of like chill. Yeah. And we get people, we get people to watch for a long time and we get millions of views on hour to hour videos. So what you got to figure out is getting people to you know, the thumbnail on the title is the most important thing, obviously when, and I'm sure everyone's heard that and, but they don't do it. You know, you hear this and then you try to update once, but then you don't do it again. We are updating hundred thumbnails a month and the ones that perform well, that, okay, this one took off from three years ago and it's rising and it just got 300,000 views this month. Let's split test it again to see if we can make it better. And that's what we, we don't stop split testing. We keep going. And that, that takes time. That takes energy, resources, maybe having someone do that, you know, but that's half the battle in my opinion, from what I've seen for our personal channel. That's awesome. And then it's really, we analyze the data. I tell people all the time, like, Yes, I go off intuition, I go off gut feeling, I go off all these different things, curiosity, but if it's not working based on the what the data shows, then we switch it up. I don't let my ego get in the way. I say, oh, people don't want to watch this. Okay, so let me cut that part out and let's get into the content quicker. I think a lot of people do long intros and and you see based on the data and your backend analytics that like the first 60 seconds is the most important. And if you can get people to stay, if you can get over 50% of people to stay in that first minute, that's great. But if it drops down to 30% because you're just like not getting into the content right away or not sharing the value, then people are going to leave. Yeah, they're going to leave and then YouTube's not going to help you <laughs> send that video. And then they're not going to promote yeah. you. Yeah, they're not going to promote you. So 80% of our traffic comes from, this is just the strategy of our channel. 80% of the traffic comes from suggested views. So not even from subscribers. And for me, that's intentional. As I'm trying to grow subscribers, I need to get videos suggested on the right-hand column of other videos more frequently mm -hmm. so new people can discover the show. And so 80% comes from you know, non-subscribers suggested viewers. And the goal is once they listen or once they watch once, can you get them to subscribe? So now they're subscribed to see your full catalog and everything coming up. And so we really... We really have a lot of strategy around the themes of content, the types of content, and checking the data all day long. Okay, what are the other channels that are related to it, that are watching our videos? What are the other videos that are related to other videos out there? People are watching shared audiences and creating content around that. So it's a constant tweaking game. It's a constant tweaking, testing data, scientific game that we have, you know, obsessing about. And um, there's so many little things you can do. You know, for the last year, we grew so many subscribers because we were posting 10 stories a day on our YouTube channel. And we were noticing when we post stories, we get more subscribers. You can track it. Stories, not shorts? Like stories. stories? Wow. Like, yeah, little 10, 15 second stories. So we were, first we started with three a day. And we're like, oh, we're getting subscribers. Let's try five. Oh, we're getting more. Let's try 10. And it tells you your subscribers where they're coming from. They're coming mm -hmm. from stories. Are they coming from your community tab? Are they coming from your, your main videos? And so, okay, whose task is it to do 10 stories a day and test this? Okay, how many posts a day on community tab to drive back to our channel? You know, all these different things, collaborations, all that stuff, it all adds up. And I think mm -hmm. people, in, in order to really grow on your YouTube um, podcast or YouTube platform, I think you've got to be obsessive about the data and don't do what you think is going to work. Do what you see is working. That's awesome. Now, as we close in here, I have a couple more things I want to chat about. Number one is, again, I've seen your growth as an interviewer over time. And it's one of the things that makes your content once people click and, and they get in or they find the podcast on Apple or Spotify, it gets them to stick around. This is why you have yeah. such long viewership and why you have such engaged people. It's because of the interviews. And so what tips do you have for somebody who is just starting this process to get in front of a person or on camera or even just audio only? How do you make that interview great for a person listening on the other end? I think be authentic to to who you are. Don't try to be someone you're not. There's a guy who his name's 
Bob A over on Instagram is his name, and he's got a, a very small podcast. Maybe gets a few thousand downloads a month, but he's been doing it for five years, and he does it every week for five years, kind of like the millennial generation. And uh, five years ago, he hit me up and he said, "Hey, you're like my one of my top dream guests. I'd love to have you on." And I was just like, "I'm not really doing a lot of interviews right now. I'm just doing my own thing." And mm-hmm. You know, it's it's hard to say yes to every podcast out there, especially if it's just starting. You obviously, you know. So I said, you know, hit me up in a year because I wanted to see, are you going to keep doing this? You know, is this a consistent thing or just something you want right now? He hits me up next year. Hey, we'd love to have you on. He did this for five years. And pretty much every time I was kind of like, I kept, I watched him. I was watching and seeing what he's up to. I kind of seeing his Instagram. I was always, I was always observing him. And ended up running into him. I was on a run here in uh, Marina del Rey on the beach. And he like runs up to me and he goes, Oh my God. Oh my God, dude, this is an incredible moment for me. Like I've been wanting to meet you and this and this, this is so serendipitous. And he goes, you know, I've got my three, I think it's his 300th episode coming out. I'd love for you to be that guest. And I go, yes. And I go, you know, I've seen you grow over the last five years. I see your consistency. I see your energy, your positivity, your effort. Like, let's do this. And so I get on the episode with him. And it was it was a nice moment because he goes, he's kind of like, <sighs> okay, like, <laughs> you know, I had a photo of your a direct message you sent to me that said, keep going. When the first year I've had that up on my wall for so many years in my room, I, my bedroom was my podcast room when I converted into, a, you know, all these things and like your voice and your podcast has been such an inspiration to me and all these things he said, and he's like, I just need to take a moment before we start because this is actually happening. And I'm just like, I feel so grateful it's happening. He was authentic in that moment that made me be like, awesome, man. I'm so glad I can be here. And, you know, I'm so glad it was a win-win for both of us. And, he was authentic to it. He wasn't just like, okay, so Lewis House is here and we're going to talk about something and not acting like it was a normal thing or whatever. He was like, he took it in. He was authentic. He was showing his kind of realness of the moment of like, this is a big moment for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, someone else may not, it may be, I'm like, whatever to them. But for him, it was like a big moment. And it made me just appreciate it and want to give more and realize like, okay, he's not like this incredible interviewer like across the table thing but it was a cool experience and um i'm glad i did it so being in that authentic place and realizing you know it took me five years almost every other month for five years i was reaching out to kevin hart's team to get him on the show took me five years to get kevin hart i'm still working on the rock right and it's been pretty much every few months for eight years, (laughs) almost nine years. And his agent is my agent and I know his publicist and I know his videographer. It's like, I know his team and it's still, you know, not happening yet. So it's being real with who you are. Um, Obviously being extremely prepared about knowing the guest and the information and um, listening. Listening is key. I think you do a great job of listening. I think I interrupt people probably too much because I get so excited. Mm -hmm. Uh, but really listening until people finish is a powerful strategy as well. Thank you for that. That's huge, especially from somebody as seasoned as you. Uh, you had mentioned reaching out to Kevin Hart and then hopefully, and you mentioned the keyword yet. You have yet yes. to, to get the rock on your show. Exactly. He's just blowing up and I would love to see that. Um, your ability to get these mega celebrities. I mean, I don't want people to think that they have to have mega celebrities on their show in order for it to be successful. There are many podcasts that I listen to with guests who I've never heard of them before. And they're some of the most valuable episodes I've ever heard, but it's very obvious. You have somehow been able to wrangle the top a listers in, in music and motion picture and film. Like how is it literally just be persistent until they say yes, or there's gotta be more to it. I think there's a few parts. One is I'm constantly building my personal brand so that Mm -hmm. people are aware of me. And so I'm finding ways to create meaningful content that is shareable, that is building my personal brand on social media. I'm I'm building my personal brand as an author. I'm building my Mm -hmm. brand as an interviewer. I'm getting press. So I'm doing whatever I can to showcase my credibility through personal brand. If someone reaches out to me and says, hey, I'd love to have you on my show, and I go to their Instagram, They've got 100 followers and they've got nothing to show. They haven't showcased their personal brand or their credibility, let's say. 
why would I go on? Why would some celebrity want to come on my show if I didn't have a personal brand that they thought, oh, this person's done something. Like mm -hmm. at least he's at a level of credibility where I can trust he's built a personal brand. So that's that's one thing is the key uh, and the value of having personal brand. I just feel like that gives you so many more opportunities. The second thing is the consistency of my show. I think because I've been around for almost nine years now, people can trust the credibility of the show. Like I said with this Bob A guy, I was just like, okay, you're just launching a show. You have like, what, three people listen. Why would I, what's in it for me? You know, it's in, something in front of you, but what's in it for, where's the win-win? So the consistency over time, after he was like, I got my 300th episode, I'd love for you to be it. I was like, yeah, now you're, you're credible and you're consistent. And I think the um, third thing would be the timing of it. Like sometimes people just, re I, I hate it when someone sends me an email and they're like, I'd love to have on our show. I had this person and this person and this person, and here's my calendar link to sign up. And I'm just like, this is the worst strategy I've ever <laughs> seen in my life to someone just cold email you and say, here are the five people I've had on that I think you might know. Here's my calendar link. Please sign up for a time that works for you. I'm just like, well, I don't need this. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's knowing the audience, the timing of what they want and what they need. So I had Dwayne Wade on a week or two ago, and he had a book come out. I tried to get him on before, but he didn't have anything to promote. Yeah. So when people have something to promote that is meaningful to them, start reaching out then or reach out three, six months before you know they have something. So be aware of what people are up to, what they're coming out with, and find ways to reach out to them or their publicist to stay in communication. Like Kevin Hart always had something that he was promoting. He always had a movie or a comedy tour, but his publicist said, no, he was booked and busy every time. But I didn't stop me from keep reaching out when I saw him having something to launch. Mm -hmm. Finally, he had a self-help book come out on Audible, an Audible original. She reached out to me. The publicist reached out to me and said, hey, now's the time. Yeah. The timing was right. The opportunity was right of what he wanted to promote. I have the audience that would want a book like that. So it was timing and you've got to be okay with people saying no to you for potentially years until you book a big guest. Hmm. That's such great advice. Now you and I are able to connect because we've developed the friendship together yes. over the years. And so you were just gracious enough to say, yeah, totally. Like I, I'd love to help you. I haven't done I haven't done interviews. I, don't, I maybe I've done five interviews all year oh. because, but I'll do it for friends because I don't have anything to promote on a big level and I don't want to do too many interviews until my next book comes out, which is hopefully the end of next year is the goal. It's the intention. Yep. Then I, that's when I'll say I'll do every interview possible. And so it's again, timing for me, but because we're friends, I'm willing to, you know, do some, whatever. So, yeah, no, thank you. And, and, and I know that you have this book coming out and we're going to have you back on to chat right. about it and get more specific to what that book can do for the audience. But, we're here just hanging out and I'm learning and I'm, I'm learning. I'm sure the audience is, and I appreciate you for that. Um, I want to know, a, I, I, I want to get this story from you. You know, we had a, a tough year last year with COVID and a lot of things happening. And one of those things that happened was, you know, Kobe Bryant passing uh, and his daughter. And that was very hard for, for the entire world. And you had interviewed Kobe Bryant on your show. Right. I, I would love to hear the story about how you were able to get Kobe. What was that experience like for you? And then, how did you feel after you heard about the news? He was my favorite interview before his passing. And I always tell people, like, everyone always asks, like, who's your favorite guest? And it's hard to say, like, one, because everyone's incredible. But I just mm -hmm. always be like, Kobe's one of my favorite for sure. And it kind of happened. It happened last minute how I got him on. It literally happened the night before the interview. We booked it. And... He had a podcast. Again, this is timing. He had a podcast called The Punies. That was an amazing podcast. It was a storytelling podcast with sports themes. Mm -hmm. and was all audio actors. So it was scripted. But it was teaching lessons to kids. So parents could play in the car uh, for 15 minutes to their kids on their way to sports practice. That's so cool. And it was a beautiful, beautiful podcast. And his team had reached out and said, hey, his podcast like just launched and I think he was like top 100, but he wanted to be like, you know, it's Kobe Bryant. He wants to be number one. Right. So, mm -hmm. 
like top 100 in Apple charts. This was 2018. And this publicist reached out to someone on my team and said, hey, Kobe wants to promote this more. And we've heard about School of Greatness with, you know, Lewis is an athlete. He has athletes on and stuff like that. So it was the right show, right timing. You know, I had credibility for years. And they said, you know, he's got one time slot like four weeks away. Are you free to do like a 15-minute interview with him, right? And so I get a call from the person on my team that says, hey, I just talked to like the publicist for Kobe and they went, you know, he's open to doing an interview in like in a month. And I go, call them back and do not hang up the phone until you get him to confirm tomorrow, first thing. I go, or sometime tomorrow, I go, call them back and do not hang up until you get a confirmation. I will go anywhere. I will do whatever it takes to make it happen tomorrow. I will cancel everything on my schedule. Jeez. And they, this is probably four or five o'clock at night the day before, right? And I'm like texting the person. I'm like, do not hang up the phone until you get a confirmation. I go, I'll do anytime, anywhere tomorrow. But if we book this a month away, it's going to get rescheduled. It's just not going to happen. I've interviewed, I've booked so many interviews with celebrities where it gets rescheduled. It gets pushed. They have something that comes up and this is like the last thing on their mind. So I said, first thing tomorrow, tell me where to go. So they call me back after they talked to the publicist and they said, okay, 8 a.m., his office, Orange County tomorrow. And I go, done. I'm in. And so this is, I don't know, 5.30, 6 o'clock at night now. I had a an event that night I was going to, a friend of mine, Lindsey Sterling, who is a friend of mine and also uh, a guest on the show, incredible violinist. She had a concert in LA that day that I'd already committed to. I had tickets to, I wanted to show up for her. So I said, okay, I think her show is at like nine o'clock. I'm going to go for an hour and then I'm going to come back and study and prepare, get some sleep. And then I was going to get up at 5 a.m. and drive to the Orange County, which is about like an hour and a half, two hours away or whatever. Mm. And um, and get there early to set up to make sure I'm prepared and not rushed. Lindsay didn't go on. There was like another band before her. Lindsay didn't go on to like 1030 or something. So I'm there Jeez. waiting. And then I go, I leave at midnight. And I'm like, for whatever reason, I was just like, I'm not stressed. I'm kind of like anxious, but I'm not too stressed about it. I'm like, I'm going to figure this out. Tiffany, my filmer editor at the time, I, I, I had talked to her before. I go, Tiffany, you need to be at my place. We're going to pack the gear, be at my place. Oh, you know, We're going to drive down and get as much information about Kobe on his personal, professional life that you know and come ready to tell me everything. And she was a big Kobe fan already, so she knew a lot. And we get in the car. I think it's like 5 a.m. or something. We listen to a few episodes of the Punies podcast. They're 15 minutes each. So I think I listened to three episodes until I get the vibe of the show. Mm -hmm. the, then I go tell me everything for the last hour. And she's telling me this, that, and that, and this story. And I go, okay, great. We get there. It's 630, maybe. The assistant like unlocks the door for us. She's there waiting. She unlocks the door to the office. And the lights are off. She turns the lights on, right? There's no one there. We walk into the, uh, the the office, his office in Orange County, and she's like, this is where we typically like film stuff or shoot things. And I was like, uh, it's not really good. It, it didn't look good for me. I go, can I see the rest of the office? It was a big office space. She said, yeah. And so we walk down this kind of long hallway with glass windows on, as conference rooms. You like walk mm -hmm. down a long hallway with glass windows on both sides of you, conference rooms and offices, that then opens up into a bigger office office space so like a bigger kind of shared office space we walked down the hall and i looked into this other space and nothing looked interesting to like set up for filming so we walked back down the hall of this glass kind of hallway and at the the last office before it opened back up into the original space we're into i see like a shape in the back probably 20 feet in the back of this room of just like a man you know just kind of sitting here like this and looking up and there was no computer on there was no phone he was just like looking up turned away so he didn't see me or anyone he was like turned in the corner of his office and i was like is that, that kobe and this is like 6 30 a.m and she goes yeah he's he's been here he's the first one here almost every day he was up at four with his daughter working on the gym and then he came here to prepare for the day and i was just like 
oh my goodness, this is insane. He's here at 6.30 a.m. The guy just won an Oscar uh, for one of his short movies. He just won five NBA championships. He just retired. And he is training at 4 a.m. with his daughter and here by 6 a.m. or whatever mm. it was. I was so impressed with just walking by and seeing him in the darkness without a laptop or phone in his hands, just visualizing, dreaming, whatever he was doing, preparing for the day. It blew me away to see like that experience. And then um, we were setting up for the next hour. You know, we were, it wasn't for another hour and a half until there was a start time. 8 a.m. is when we're supposed to start. So I'm wondering, we set it all up and I'm wondering, is he going to come out at all? And he can't see me, but I can see in a part of his office because mm-hmm. where we were setting up, we could kind of see in part of it, but the lights were turned off the whole time. So I'm thinking, is he coming out? Is he going to say hi? I have no idea. Maybe 10 minutes before 8 a.m., the lights turn on and someone, some executive walks into the office and I don't know what they, they talk about, but the lights come on. Three minutes before 8, he comes out. And this guy's like punctual on time. He comes out. And I'm thinking to myself, I got three minutes because the the publicist said you've got 20 minutes for an interview now uh little wayne and his production crew is setting up in another part of the office now they had come and they're setting up for an interview right afterwards so like in Mm -hmm. 20 minutes little wayne is doing an interview for some like i don't know hbo sports thing whatever security all these people it's just like i'm like what what is my life right now this is weird and i'm thinking to myself man i hope you know, when you meet people that are inspiring to you online or something or an author or celebrity, and then you meet them and you're like completely underwhelmed. This was the opposite. I was overwhelmed of how kind and generous and present he was. And right away he came up to me, he just smiled and shook my hand. And, and I remember thinking, I've got three minutes to connect with him because if mm-hmm. this is only 20 minutes long, you know, I want to make sure he goes in deep. And I, and I said to him right away, I said, hey, Kobe, I just want to say I, I really acknowledge you for – so Tiffany's putting on the mic, and I'm trying to talk to him before we get started. And I'm like, I just want to acknowledge you because you know I, I have a lot of Olympic friends who have played in the Olympics, and all of them say some of their favorite moments are when they got to meet you in the Olympic Village, like in the Athletes Village, and how cool you were and how you just like took photos with people and how you showed up and watched sports and just cheered on the other USA athletes. And I just really acknowledge you for that. And I say, I play with the USA team handball. You know, I've got a lot of Olympic friends. And he goes, well, you play handball? And I go, yeah. He goes, I love that sport. I played that growing up in Italy. It was one of my favorite sports. No way. So right, right away, we're talking about handball. Did you know that? Did you know that he had played? I didn't know that, but I knew, but I knew he grew up in Italy. And I was thinking, he's probably heard of this sport, you know, because mm. it's, big, it's bigger in Europe. So I was thinking, he's probably heard of it. But he's like, I love that sport. It's incredible. I played it as a kid growing up in Italy. I go, that's amazing. And then I said, you know, we've got some, we've got some mutual friends, and they they just say you're like the most incredible guy. And he was like, and the publicist was like, who do you know? Who have you had on that knows Kobe? And I go, Novak Djokovic. And I said, someone right before I was saying someone else, he goes, Novak is my brother. I love that guy. He's such a competitor. Mm. He's so cool. And you guys are connecting. We were vibing like right away. He was lighting up thinking about like his childhood in Italy and the Olympics and handball and his friend Novak. And I had like these pages of papers of everything that I wasn't allowed to talk about from the publicist, (laughs) right? You can't talk about this and don't bring up this. And it was like all these things that were off limits. And I go, I, I reviewed these notes of like what not to talk about. Is there anything else that's off limits that you don't want me to talk about or bring up? And he looked at me in my we're sitting now like, you know, I can touch his knee. We're like right next to each other. And he's looking mm-hmm. at me, he's like, and I, and I go, and I know we've only got 20 minutes. Uh, so I'm I'm being mindful of time. And I know there's there's these things off limits. Is, is there anything else? And he looks me in the eyes, he goes, ask me anything you want and take as long as you want. And I was just thinking to myself, I get chills just thinking about it. I was like, this guy is just, you know, we connected in three minutes. And he was just really generous with his energy, with his time, and he had a full pack day. And That's he was so cool. he was generous with his his wisdom, like he really shared deeply. And then afterwards, he actually started following me. His account still follows me. He was messaging me. He's like, "Hey, I would love to do this again." We messaged a few times because his team reached out the year later in 2019 
when he had his, uh, a book come out. Mm-hmm. And I was supposed to do another interview with him at the end of 2019 during uh, September, October time. But I had my annual conference, Summit of Greatness, that exact date, like that week. I could have like flown back for a day and then gone back to the event. But it's I really needed that time to prepare for the event. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, he's going to have another book and another thing. And he said, like, let's do another one in the future if you can't do it. And I was like, oh, I'll be able to do something with him next year. And then three months later, you know, he passed. And so it was, it was really unfortunate. I'm really grateful I got to have that, that experience with him. And I got, to, you know, it's not like I was best friends or friends with the guy. I met him once. But for me, it was a really meaningful experience. And so many people have said that interview with him was one of their favorite interviews of Kobe of all time. And so for me, it was really meaningful to have that moment and to be able to create it, you know, it was unfortunate that I didn't get to have more moments with him, but it was a powerful, a powerful experience that I'll always remember. Thank you so much, Lewis, for giving us that story. I was right there with you when you were talking about it. I, I appreciate that. And I recommend everybody go watch that uh, right now yeah. if you have an opportunity. So um, we'll link that in the, in the show description and everything. Lewis, I could talk to you for for hours, my man. I appreciate you so much. Uh, the Thanks, School brother. of Greatness on YouTube and on your favorite podcast app. Anything else you want to plug right now? Or we'll have you back on with the book later. But man, I just appreciate you so much. No, thanks, man. I appreciate you. This has been great. Thank you. All right. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Lewis. You can find him at The School of Greatness, any podcast app, obviously, and also, of course, on YouTube, too. I hope you check him out because he's got a wealth of knowledge, some amazing interviews, and in my opinion, becoming one of the, if not the top interviewer in this kind of space and very inspirational content. He's got some books coming out as well, some great books that he's once published before, including one called The School of Greatness, New York Times bestseller, which you should check out. And I'm just very grateful to have Lewis as a friend and, and thankful he came on to help us today. So definitely check him out. Also, make sure to subscribe to the Smart Passive Income Podcast. We've got a lot more great content coming your way this year. A lot of amazing interviews with a lot of amazing successful stories um, and not just people who are A-listers like Lewis as well, but people who are in the SPI community who are literally right in the middle of building their own businesses too and we get to hear some insight from them and what they're up to. So again, you're not going to want to miss it. Make sure you hit subscribe and until next time, keep up the great work. I appreciate you. Thank you for being here and as always, Team Flynn for the win. Peace out. Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income podcast at smartpassiveincome.com. I'm your host, Pat Flynn. Sound design and editing by Paul Gregoris. Our senior producer is Sarah Jane Hess. Our series producer is David Grabowski. And our executive producer is Matt Gartland. The Smart Passive Income podcast is a production of SPI Media. We'll catch you in the next session.